On one occasion, the Duke took a lady guest's hands in his, and, quote, closing her fingers together, enclosing her hands over them, the Duke continued, You just don't understand. The Jews had Germany and the tentacles. All Hitler tried to do was free the tentacles. And with that, he released the lady's hands. What a weirdo. That would be so creepy. Hello, how are you? Welcome to my channel. My name is Cheer Denise, and today we are doing the final episode of Trader King, chapter 25, entitled Trader King. And it's really just sort of a wrap up of everything that we've discussed so far, and just kind of talks about what the objective of the book was and did it meet its goal, which I think we can all hardly agree that it did. The title of the book is Trader King, the Scandalous Exile of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And there's nothing normal about the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And it was 100% scandalous. But I will let Mr. Lowney make his case in this last chapter. As I've said before, this is gonna be a short episode, but I wanted to make sure that we did not miss even one episode, even if we all already heartily agree with the findings of the chapter. Um, it starts out by saying, it is a rare writer who has not tackled at least one book on the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, asserts Greg Brown. Books have been written proving conclusively that they were a good thing and that they were a bad thing, that she loved him, but he didn't love her, that he loved her, but she didn't love him, that they loved one another, and that they both hated one another. So every book under the sun that could examine this relationship has already been written and already been done. 35 years after her death and almost 50 years after his, the books, both fiction and nonfiction, documentaries, musicals, and films continue to appear and to adapt very different points of view toward the couple. Some still argue that this was one of the great love affairs of the 20th century. Others, that Wallace felt trapped in a marriage that she had never wanted. But no book before has started at the abdication in 1936 and really fully looked at what happened to the Windsors in their exile. It's a genius idea. Because so much happened, and there's so much that happened after the abdication that should have alleviated the hearts and minds of all the British people who looked on with sadness initially, that they had really escaped a bullet. I mean, if there's one comment that I have gotten more than any other in every chapter in this entire book is that, wow, didn't England really dodge a bullet with that one? And this book proves that there was nothing that David could have brought to the throne that would have made England a better place. Um, he was entirely too self-consumed to have been a good king. And this book sets it out, categorizes the ways in which he was so selfish. He couldn't even run his own life. He was so selfish. He never even was able to find a job. He was so selfish because he couldn't find one thing he was able to do for longer than five seconds. The book goes on to say that the accepted account is that they were rejected by the royal family because the former king had put private desire above public duty, and that they could not be seen to support a man who had turned his back on his birthright. And there's some truth in that. The monarch was supreme governor of the Church of England, and he simply could not hold that role and marry a twice-divorced woman. But might the royal rejection also be because it was believed that the couple had behaved in a treacherous manner? And I think that that was the far greater reason. If David had wanted to marry Wallace... And it was simply that she had been divorced twice, but that everything else was above board. He was great and she was great. I really think that the royal family could have made their peace with it and sort of ignored the fact that as head of the church, he was doing something that was against what the church asked for. The upper class was used to having marital affairs. It wasn't like that big of a deal. You know, your marriages were essentially arranged and then you went and you found somebody that you could actually enjoy being in love with. If he had decided that he wanted to marry somebody who was twice divorced, if anything, and I've made this point before, he would have been doing a better thing than what his compatriots were up to. His peers were all having affairs, but not marrying the women they were having affairs with. He was at least trying to marry the woman he loved. And so I don't really feel like his getting married was ever the ultimate reason, but it was the, it was the morally sophisticated reason. It was the one that could be given and everyone could be like, yes, quite right, quite right. But if you look around, everybody's living crazy. Everyone's doing what they want. No one cares what the Church of England thinks about in their own lives. They're all doing what they want. I, I fully support this idea that that was the cover for the real reason. 
Lowney goes on to say that the conventional line is that the Duke, like the rest of his family and many politicians, financiers, and aristocrats before September 1939, was determined that the carnage of the First World War must be avoided at all costs, and that some form of accommodation with Hitler was possible to allow him to focus on the real threat to the British Empire, which was communism. And the conventional line also says that in the summer of 1940, the couple became unwitting pawns in a Nazi plan to persuade the Duke to take on the role of the British Petain. The German and Spanish officials involved then exaggerated what was happening to suit their own agendas and please their superiors. The Windsors were naive and foolish at worst, and they used German approaches to leverage their own interests. Though the Windsors continued in their exile in the Bahamas to believe that Britain's best interests lay in negotiating peace, the entry of America into the war in December 1941 put an end to their idealistic notions, and they then served the crown with loyalty. It is best summed up by the Duke's authorized biographer, Philip Zeigler, who, who furthered this conventional idea about what David was really up to. Just sort of this poor guy who just didn't want to get into another World War I, who just was a little bit foolish and made some bad friends, and that ultimately he was loyal to England. Zeigler says the Duke felt the war could and should have been avoided, that he was a defeatist about the prospects of victory in 1940-1941, that he preached the virtues of a negotiated peace. He'd been indiscreet and extravagant enough in what he said to give the Germans some grounds for believing that he might be ready to play an active part in securing such peace and returning to the throne after it had been negotiated. That's bad enough. What they do not show and cannot show, since no evidence exists, is that the Duke would have ever contemplated accepting such an invitation if it had been issued. Well, Zeigler must have been asleep when he wrote his book, because what are you talking about no evidence exists? This whole book is the evidence that it exists. The argument of this book, and thanks be to God for it, is that there is plenty of evidence, as demonstrates in the previous pages, that the Windsors were not foolish and naive, but actively engaged with the German intrigues. The Germans had long realized that King Edward VIII was a potential ally, and both he and Wallace were targeted before, during, and after his reign. One of the key figures in the German plan was the Austrian princess Stephanie von Hohenlohe, who was sent to London, where she took an apartment in Bryanstone Court next to Wallace. According to a British intelligence report, her role was to select from amongst the British establishment possible future friends of Hitler in Nazi Germany. Notes for an unpublished memoir show the list was headed by the Prince of Wales and Wallace Simpson. Like, they were the top priority? It's like, who can I decide is going to help me, uh, David and Wallace, you know? She didn't need, she, I mean, it, it wasn't like they were at the bottom of the list. It's not like, well, you know, I might investigate. She knew full well that she could go to them. This the Austrian princess did, working through social hostesses such as Emerald Cunard. Countless sources speak of Wallace's closeness to the German embassy, and in particular, Joachim von Ribbentrop, including Philip Zeigler, who was writing with exclusive access to papers in the Royal Archives. The Danish ambassador told Ralph Wigram in the Foreign Office that Mrs. Simpson, quote, tried to mix herself up in politics. She endeavored in every way to single out the German embassy and have everything German preferred at court. Under the influence of these surroundings, the king at times made statements which tended to show that his sympathies were colored by Nazism and fascism. I know that David was really proud of his German heritage and that though he was British, he considered himself almost just as German because that's where he spent his summers and that's he spent a great deal there right before World War I and he spoke German and, he, you know, these were his relatives, he many relatives there. And so, you know, you almost wonder if it all began with Wallace laying a trap for him by showing, you know, where she says that she wanted to have everything German preferred at court. Was she... Doing that for David's sake, because she knew that he would appreciate that in her, and she was sort of, you know, was she doing that back when she was trying to try to lure him to her side and make for herself a good match? Or was this after they were already together? I'm not quite sure about the timeline of that statement. But she's enough of an operator that it would not surprise me if she began acquainting herself with the Germans, not because she didn't believe in their politics, I think she probably did, but also because she knew that that would lure David in as well. And I think that she wanted his attention right up into the point where she realized that all he wanted was her. I think she was hoping that they could, you know, sort of dilly-dally along and, you know, hang out with one another and just sort of, you know, have a little thing going on the side. But I don't think she ever had any intention of being his one and only. 
But as she was trying to get into his circle, I do wonder if she sort of played the German card a little heavily. Kenneth Rose staying with the former MI15 officer Victor Rothschild in the 1980s noted in his diary some talk of MI5. They had reason to think that Edward VIII, when Prince of Wales, was in too close with Ribbentrop. Another Nazi informer was Wallace's dressmaker Anne Walkoff, imprisoned in 1940 as part of a spy ring centered around the American diplomat Tyler Kent. MI5 had first become aware of Walkoff in 1935 when one of their agents reported that Walkoff was using her position with Mrs. Wallace Simpson, the future Duchess of Windsor, to provide the Nazis with confidential information derived from the Prince of Wales. Lord Vansittart informed the then Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin, but no action appears to have been taken. That's, an int- that's a huge breach of national secrets. At that time, the prin- he was still Prince of Wales, and... He tells everything to Wallace, who then, you know, was, clearly could not shut her mouth. The dressmaker, who would have been there from dawn till dark, she finds out all about it. And then she's just carrying those secrets back to the Nazis. And then the prime minister knows it. Nothing's done. I mean, it's almost like they're complicit in David's behavior. You you almost wonder, were they okay with the fact that he was doing this? Were they like, well, we kind of secretly think so, too. Or were they trying to give him enough rope to hang himself? Questions abound. After the abdication, the Germans kept up the pressure and the Windsors were happy to play along, culminating in October of 1937 tour of Germany and the friendship with a series of Nazi sympathizers. It's perfectly clear in the, in the summer of 1940, the Duke, who reported none of his communications with the various Spanish emissaries to the British authorities, knew that he was dealing with the Germans and not the Spanish. How else could his maid have been able to travel to Paris? And those various attempts at delaying departure to the Bahamas had more to do with the internal situation than his domestic affairs. There is then the killer telegram of August 15, 1940, with him agreeing to stay in touch with the Germans using a special code, should the situation change. This is backed up by plenty of evidence, including the diaries of the MI5 officer Guy Liddell and Alan Lancel's correspondence. Anybody who wants to say, well, there's just no evidence. There's no evidence that he did anything. Y'all didn't do your research. A report from the British intelligence agent in Lisbon during the war related that the Germans had recently approached Charles Badeau to determine if Windsor would be prepared to be king in the event of a German victory. The report contained a transcript of a supposed conversation between Mrs. Badeau and Wallace, in which the former referred to such a discussion between Badeau and the Duke in 1937, and that the question then discussed was, quote, very prominent in the minds of certain powers today. We've been asked seriously of the possibility, and we, continuing to believe that both of you are still of the same opinion, have given absolute assurance that it is not only possible, but can be counted on. Are we right? Though vague, Sir Alexander Cadogan's response is revealing. The paragraph is certainly capable of the blackest interpretations, but it would be difficult to get a conviction on it. So, Mrs. Bedell might have said that Wallace suggested to her that, you know, We have been approached about siding with the Nazis and we're playing around with the idea. You know, we're playing around with the idea. We're not quite sure yet. We're leaving our options open, but it's definitely been talked about and discussed. David Eccles, who had been told to keep an eye on the Duke during July 1940, later admitted that the Germans were trying to get him to agree and he would sort of play the hand for a peace conference in which the Germans would see that he got got the throne. Matters had become so serious that MI5 had even opened a file on the couple, an unprecedented occurrence for a member of the royal family. Everyone from Churchill and the royal household in the intelligence service believed the Duke to be a traitor rather than a fool, hence the desperate attempts to cover up, delay, and minimize the publication of the captured German communications. What a devastating reality to realize that somebody is not just a fool, but a traitor. Because that's everyone's fear, isn't it? You see everybody bumbling around being general idiots uh, in the government, and you always think to yourself, is this a case of nefarious behavior, or is this a case of colossal ignorance and laziness? And you always sort of hope it's laziness and colossal ignorance, and that it isn't something greater. But I think sometimes our hopes are unfounded, because how could everybody be this dumb? And in the case here, how could he possibly have been this foolish? I just hardly believe that he couldn't know what was going on to some degree. 
it's not possible that he was able to always work so cleverly in his own defense and so cleverly for his own aid. But then suddenly all of his wits dried up anytime he had anything to do with politics or these great players in the world or the Nazis or any of this. Then suddenly he was this poor dim-witted fool who couldn't figure out his right hand from his left. That doesn't even make sense. Of course, not all the capture documents were made public. Donald Cameron Watt, later professor of international history at the University of London, was the first British historian to see the Windsor section when some 400 tons of documents arrived at Wad- Waddesdon Hall. Everything was there, which we thought should have been there, with one exception. There was no record of a meeting at Berchtesgaden. The question one had to ask was why not? Kenneth Rose wrote in his diary in 1979 after meeting Anthony Eden's widow and Churchill's niece. Clarice Avon tells me that she'd always hated the Windsors and thought it wicked of Winston to destroy the evidence against the Duke's apparent readiness to become a German stooge in 1940. Indeed, Churchill, who had done so much to support the king during the abdication crisis, refused in September of 1958 to go on a cruise on Aristotle Onassis's yacht, Christina, because the Duke and the Duchess of Windsor had been invited. And since 1940, he had never felt the same about the Duke and thought that it would be wrong for him to associate with him too closely. That is the best thing I've heard about Churchill for a while. That makes me happy. It really does make me happy that he could see that the Duke wasn't just some poor, misplaced, and displaced, and exiled prince who couldn't seem to run his own life but poor beleaguered fellow he had the best intentions like I've been worried this whole time that that's kind of how Churchill felt about him and I was like why are you giving him the benefit of the doubt when he's so clearly a traitor and I thought Churchill you're too smart for this you know how could you possibly fall for the foolishness that is laid before you how could you possibly think that this guy isn't anything but a traitor so I am so pleased to hear that he was not willing to associate with the duke in real life Now, the Duke may have claimed in 1966 that, quote, I acknowledge that, along with too many other well-meaning people, I let my admiration for the good side of the German character dim what was being done by the bad. I thought that the immediate task of my generation was to prevent another conflict between Germany and and the West, and and that would bring down our civilization. I thought that the rest of us would be fence-sitters while the Nazis and the Reds slogged it out. But there's plenty of evidence that his views about the Nazis did not change after the war and that his choice of close friends such as Robert Young and Oswald Mosley was unfortunate. You'll recall that both of those people were ardent supporters of the Nazis. And so for him to constantly be like, I, uh, you might have thought that I had Nazi sympathies, but I, I, all I was really trying to do was to keep us out of another war. I didn't know any of that was going to happen. Please, man, your politics lined right up with theirs. My parents were horrified by their dinner table talk, where they made it perfectly clear that the world would have been a better place if Jews were exterminated, recalled Cleveland Amory's stepdaughter, Dr. Gaya Lightheart. On one occasion, the Duke took a lady guest's hands in his and, quote, closing her fingers together and closing her hands over them, the Duke continued, You just don't understand. The Jews had Germany in the tentacles. All Hitler tried to do was free the tentacles. And with that, he released the lady's hands. What a weirdo. That would be so creepy. Patrick Kinross was shocked when the Duke claimed, I never thought Hitler was such a bad chap. Why don't you and Kanye go to get... (laughs) He and Kanye are real meeting of the minds. Roy Strong writes in his diaries of playing Canasta with the Duke. You have to be really dim to play that. And how the Duke eulogized Hitler is confirmed all that one had feared. There can be little doubt that if the Duke of Windsor had not renounced the throne, that he would have tried to use his influence to seek peace with Hitler in 1940. Without the support of the king after Dunkirk, even Churchill might have been unable to resist the pressure from Lord Halifax and others to negotiate with the Germans. If so, the history of the world would have been very different. Other what-if questions remain. What if the Prince of Wales had never met Mrs. Simpson on that weekend house party in January 1931? How much did she encourage his pro-German and anti-Semitic beliefs? Without her by his side, would he have had the courage or the strength to pursue such a traitorous course? The abdication remains one of the most traumatic episodes in royal history, and the tension between public obligations and private desires continues to be a significant trope in the story of the royal family. The country was lucky that in the crisis which Edward VIII generated, George VI and his daughter Elizabeth rose to the challenge. 
Edward's refusal to discharge his duties as king, as he would wish to do, was ironically the making of the modern British royal family. If Edward's renunciation of the throne threatened to destroy the monarchy, his brother and niece saved it. The end. And wasn't that good? That was such a good book. Now, all of you know that we're going to do the Diana book. Um, we are going to begin it next week. Um, I'm going to give myself a week off to kind of get a head start. You, what I've done is next week, I have already pre-recorded some episodes on this book right here. It came to me from a YouTuber who is, has a huge channel. It's like million, over a million people follow this person. His name is Tyler Zed and he has written a memoir. And so he sent it and he was really very fair. He's like, I, I think it looks like you kind of do royal stuff and celebrity um, books and I'm not a celebrity, but if you would, you know, would you consider reading it and maybe review it? And I read it and I was just blown away. Fabulous book. So what I decided to do was I went ahead and I recorded the episodes for that book so that I could release them this following week. And that would give me a chance to kind of catch up on this Diana books. I am always working like the day before. I release an episode and with school and you guys know like all of you guys who have either had kids in school or have kids currently in school it feels like after Christmas everything ramps up there's always stuff due there's always some project there's always something you have to prep for and the slow days of school are over so it's all just a rat race until the end at this point so I wanted to give myself kind of a uh, like a buffer week to get ahead on some of those Diana episodes so I'm going to start releasing the Diana book next Sunday so a week from today um, but in the meantime I will still be putting out content but it will be this book and I'm choosing to do it that way because Tuesday is the publication date of this book. So kind of like a little launch for this book. We'll be doing it next week. And then we'll begin with our um, royal book on Sunday. Now, you know we're doing Diana. And then after that, all of you keep asking if I'm going to do the King Charles book. King Charles the Third, And yes, I am. Absolutely. 110%. I mean, could I do any other? Absolutely not excited about that. Um, and so I think what we're going to do is just focus on one book at a time. Um, just for right now, I think it's just gonna be easier for me. And then it also means that we can get through the book a little bit faster. So Diana first, a week from today, and then we're going to, after that book's done, read our King Charles book and then whatever else comes out, however else the spirit leads. But there's always a thousand books to cover. And so we'll never run out of content, which thrills me to my very core. Okay, I will see you guys later. Thank you for hanging out with me on this brief episode. Hopefully I'll see a lot of you guys this week for the launch of Tyler Zed's book, Trailer Park Parable. Um, if that's not your fair, don't worry. We will be together again on Sunday for Diana and we will be doing uh, multiple episodes of that a week. So looking forward to it and I'll see you guys soon. Bye. <laughs>